Good morning, everyone. As my co-resident then so kindly introduced, I am Stephanie Hanchuk. I'm one of the current PGY4 residents here at Yale Urology. I'm going to be talking about prehabilitation and major urologic surgery with a special focus on radical cystectomy. So every good talk starts with an origin story. My origin story is driving up and down 95 every day. I gained 30 minutes to start listening to podcasts. Some of you may be familiar with a podcast called Backtable Urology. It's really wonderful. Started by Didia Bagrodia at UC San Diego, where he brings on different premier urologists to talk about topics. And early on, I think maybe episode eight or nine, he brought on Angela Smith from UNC, and they had a two-hour discussion about their protocol at University of North Carolina for prehabilitation for radical cystectomy patients. To me, a light bulb kind of went off and it seemed kind of an obvious role to how can we make our sickest and highest risk patients have better perioperative outcomes by addressing them from the start. So just to rewind for everyone, what exactly is this concept of prehab? The American College of Surgeons defines this as the practice of enhancing a patient's functional capacity before surgery in the aim of improving post-operative outcomes. I wanted to ground this in a case, this is not a patient we have seen, but is very similar to many patients you meet in the urology oncology clinics here at Yale. Think of a 71 year old male. He has T2 bladder cancer who presents to your clinic for discussion of radical cystectomy and ileocondrial creation. His past medical history has many chronic comorbid conditions, diabetes, CKD stage three, coronary disease, CHF, and a tobacco use history. He's had percutaneous coronary interventions and an appendectomy. He's on appropriate home medications for his diseases, including aspirin and Plavix. His BMI is 35.4, and his ECOG status is 2. I obviously loaded the boat on this patient, but mostly to make a point. What are these factors that you're thinking about as soon as you meet the patient that is going to influence his overall surgical outcomes? We can kind of divide these into two categories. There's modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. We can't change the patient's age. We can't change his tumor or his tumor biology. We can't change the fact that he has multiple of these comorbid um, medical conditions or has had surgery in the past. But what we can do is we can work to optimize the impact of his comorbid conditions and his class one obesity on the potential of having negative impact in a perioperative setting on his overall outcome. So anytime I have a clinical question, I always turn to my guidelines. Looking at every guideline that, that gives us information on GU oncology, all they say about this is that, quote, clinicians should attempt to optimize patient performance status in the perioperative setting. Well, that is a nice idea, but it's not really much guidance on how we should do this, what the best measures are, and what would be the most useful outcomes to look at if we were to design studies. And so we really need to think about this every time we meet a patient with a new cancer diagnosis. Why is that? Because the window of opportunity is quite short. And radical cystectomy patients, they often are undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and that gives you a longer window of time to interact on some of their chronic comorbid conditions, as well as malnutrition and, and PT. But as we can imagine, these patients, as we meet them and they go through numerous medical interactions for preoperative workup, preoperative diagnostic and therapeutic operative interventions, as well as I mentioned, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there's a large time for them to be even further deconditioned before we even get to the operating room. So what can we do for these patients? Well, these are the four modifiable risk factors that prehabilitation is really centered on and the best data is out to support. I'm going to be talking about each of these and the data behind them, the studies that have been done, and kind of the biology and the thought process of why these would aid in perioperative outcome enhancement. So starting with nutrition, up to one in five urologic oncology patients comes to us already in a state of protein calorie malnutrition. We're already starting behind when we first meet them. And why is this really important? Because we know cancer is a catabolic disease. That means an average patient who was well-nourished, had a good diet, and was able to keep up with their protein needs during a state of having a cancer or a malignancy, all of a sudden their body is using increased energy expenditure. So a lot of our patients who are high risk, already calorie malnutrition, have a very difficult time keeping up with the demands that cancer places on their body, both just having an underlying malignancy and through all of the treatments that come in lieu. 
And so how can we measure this and think about which of our patients are highest risk? So taking um, a page from the book of Dr. Amir Khan, who is our sarcopenia expert, um, sarcopenia is something that we can see and note. It's an objective measure noted on CT scans. It's defined as the involuntary loss of skeletal muscle mass. Unfortunately, by the age of 40, you start to have a linear decline in your lean muscle mass as well as your strength. And by age 80, you can lose up to 50% of your muscle mass involuntarily without even trying. This is thought to affect up to 50% of urologic oncology patients. As you can see here, there's many studies that have been done and there's a lot of strong data to suggest that it is an independent risk factor for 90 day complication rates, decreased overall survival and decreased cancer specific survival in our patients. So what's another measure that we talk about when we think about a patient's preoperative nutrition? I've been taught this through medical school, through residency, always pre-op labs, nutrition labs, albumin. Well, we do know that preoperative albumin less than 3.5 does portend a higher complication rate and mortality after radical cystectomy. How does that make sense in any sort of biology? What is the thought process behind albumin's relationship to nutrition? I never really understood it. It seems like a lot of other people didn't either. So the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition came out with this position paper in 2021. And I couldn't really quote it better myself. But they came very strongly down on the fact that albumin is a characterization of inflammation. It is not a characterization of nutrition status or protein energy malnutrition. We do know there is an association between inflammation and malnutrition. However, this does not correlate between malnutrition and these protein levels. So therefore, they probably came down and said that serum albumin and prealbumin should not serve as measures of total body protein or muscle mass and they therefore should not be used as nutrition markers. So the idea here is that albumin is a marker of inflammation and that inflammation can be associated to malnutrition, but it's really not a direct proxy as many of us have been led to think and I've been taught to think um, as a pre-nutrition marker. So what can we do about this and what's kind of the idea behind how we can supplement nutrition to help our patients is this idea of immunonutrition, giving nutritional supplements to enhance the activity of the immune system. Now I'm going to take you back here to your pre-med days and explain amino acids again. So amino acids come in two groups, essential and non-essential. Essential amino acids are those that are essential to our survival and are synthesized by our liver. And usually, in normal times, our body is able to make enough to meet our physiologic demands. Unfortunately, during times of surgical stress, some of these essential amino acids can convert to a category called conditionally essential, which basically means that usually our body is able to keep up with the demands, but when we have rapidly divided cells needed for wound healing and immune response, we're not able to keep up and we become in an immune deficient state. Arginine and glutamine are two of the main targets of this amino acid, this conditionally essential amino acid that have shown a lot of good data and supplementation helping the, to augment the immune response after surgery. In addition to this, other branch chain amino acids as well as omega-3 fatty acids have been shown in the literature throughout medicine to lower inflammation and support immune cell function. So you might ask, what's the actual data in urology on this? So in cystectomy and nutrition, um, people have done wonderful randomized control trials, and I really applaud these groups for going out there and putting this together. Um, started with Dr. Hamilton Reeves at University of Kansas with a small study, 29 patients. She took two groups, did this amino-enhanced nutrition, including arginine and fish oil, with versus kind of a general protein shake, like a boost energy shake. It was a rather short study, five days before, five days after radical cystectomy. Unfortunately, there was no difference in the 30-day complications, but there was a decrease in 40% of the infection rate at 90 days in the patients that had the amino-enhanced nutrition. What I thought was actually really interesting about this study, and they listed here, is a discussion about the actual biology. What is the biology going on that may relate to an improved outcome? So they were able to take cells from each patient and look, like, look at something called myeloid-derived suppressor cells. These are cells that are known to proliferate very actively in times of surgical stress, that their role ends up being suppressing T cell function and immune cell function. So obviously we want our patients to have a robust and immune system as possible during healing stages to reduce infection rates. The patients that had the amino-enhanced nutrition actually had a lot lower of these suppressor cell counts. And so that was their postulate postulate that because they had less immunosuppression at the time of this enhanced nutrition intervention, 
that therefore led to a decrease in fracture rate, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, Dr. Chad Rich, as well as on the next paper, um, Michael Cookson, Sam Chang, and Dave Penson um, from a multi-centered study with the randomized control trial took this and um, made it a little bigger, doubled the sample size, and looked at a nutritional supplement versus a multivitamin in two groups. They did this for a month before and a month after radicals was second in. The primary outcome was 30 days post-op. How many hospital-free days did each patient have? There was no change noted in the primary outcome, but they did show um, that the complication level was decreased in the oral nutrition supplement group, not statistically significantly so, and they did show an increase in post-operative sarcopenia in the group one multivitamin. So their conclusion was that if we can supplement oral nutrition, maybe it doesn't change the hospital free days, but it leaves the patient in a better state in terms of sarcopenia, which we know is an independent risk factor. Both of these studies, as you can see, didn't come out with strong evidence for nutrition, but kind of came up with small blips, small positive signals on how this can impact our patients. Moving on from nutrition, we can think about physical fitness and how this impacts our patients. We do know that patients who are more physically fit um, do better after surgery. Why? This enhances their post-operative mobilization, their activity and strength. Frailty is associated on across all surgical spectrums with increased post-op morbidity and discharge to rehabilitation. We do know as well in the prostate literature that low pre-op physical activity is associated with lower quality of life and higher incontinence rates after radical prostatectomy. So what about in cystectomy? There's actually really a lot of nice studies. This is primarily throughout Europe and Denmark and the UK where they did randomized control trials, looked at both home base and supervised training for patients pre-op radical cystectomy. A number of these patients did undergo these trials of physical therapy while they were undergoing neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They were performed anywhere from two to six weeks prior to radical cystectomy. Unfortunately, again, there was no differences in rates and severities of complications or lengths of hospital stay. What it did show is that if you have the patients work out, they have better physical fitness post-op. So they are able to walk longer, walk faster, walk further, and have a return to their activity of daily living faster. So it may have an overall impact on the patient's quality of life, but it's not really, again, impacting their perioperative surgical outcomes. Next is a topic I think that's extremely important, but probably often not talked about, is the psychological health and the impact of a patient undergoing a surgery for a new diagnosis of malignancy that's going to have a lifelong impact on their lifestyle and care. We do know that up to one in four patients with a GU cancer diagnosis has an underlying history of anxiety, depression, or mood disorder. We know from the general surgery literature that mental distress associated with infection rates, poor wound healing, longer lengths of stays, and overall reduced adherence to post-op instruction. A systematic review conducted on radical cystectomy patients had very mixed results. They put patients through short two to four week psychological interventions and had limited evidence for benefit. They believed in hypothesis that this would likely require longer and more individualized approaches. Last but not least, I think this is the most obvious one that you know, pans the literature from start to finish, that cigarette smoking is both a risk factor for development of urothelial carcinoma, as well as a risk factor for, again, the similar um, adverse post-operative outcomes, including wound healing, um, increased infection rates, and post-operative complications. It is advised by all urologic associations and the guidelines that at least for one month preoperatively to have patients stop smoking, recreational substance abuse, as well as limit their alcohol intake. So the idea is here, we looked at a lot of these individual randomized control trials and there wasn't much of a positive flag here. So the group um, down in combination, and you might see and recognize some of these players from the earlier studies, Dr. Hamilton Reeves at University of Kansas, Dr. Chang at Vanderbilt, looked and said, what if we put this all together? What if we were able to do a multifaceted preoperative program? And they were able to, at Vanderbilt, complete a program with 82 patients. Of note, 60% of these roughly received new adjuvant chemotherapy. They did it in a really nice way and kind of something I want to in in integrate here as well, if we could, is they designed an integrated EMR order set for every radical cystectomy patient to assess the five domains that had the greatest evidence behind them. So they were all, once you saw and were booking a radical cystectomy or had a new patient with a uh, T2 diagnosis, they were all looked at smoking cessation, stomal education, nutrition screenings and interventions, physical therapy, and site screenings. And what did they see? They had a very nice and high 
compliance. So 100% of their patients were screened for malnutrition and 82% of them screened positive and received pre-op nutritional supplementation. As far as physical therapy, 52% um, were deemed pre-op PT candidates. The primary outcome in the study was really, is this feasible? Can we make this type of preoperative prehab work at our facility? And clearly they were able to. The secondary outcomes, as you can see, the surgical outcomes trended towards more positive results in these patients, but wasn't entirely positive, and none of these were statistically significant. I did really like, though, something I learned through preparing this presentation was this concept of a resource length of stay. We had this conversation on rounds this morning about it's not really fair to compare two patients or two different conditions always with length of stay. Radical cystectomy patients tend to stay longer. So this is a, a newer idea of dividing the length of stay of a patient over the rated complexity of their disease. And an ideal ratio for this is about 1.5 um, for patients. So they did see after the intervention, they were able to get this down to 1.8 versus originally 2.1 days of resource length of stay. So I really want everyone here to be putting their thinking gears on in their heads. And although I spent a lot of time today talking about radical cystectomy patients and the interventions that may help them, Anytime you want to dock a robot, take out a scalpel, thinking about operating on a patient, whether it's for prostate cancer, kidney cancer, or bladder cancer, I really urge you um, to think about how we can get this done. So I mentioned Vanderbilt, I mentioned the UK, I mentioned Sweden, all of these places are doing this, but what about Smilo Cancer Hospital? We are an NCI um, comprehensive cancer center with amazing resources and resources that I, we actually pass every day. So while I was preparing this talk, I actually went down to meet some of the people and some of the resources we have here. So on NP1, right when you go past the elevators, there is the Smilo Cancer Hospital Survivorship Clinic, where I literally, Scott can tell you, he's on the call today, um, walked in and said, who here does prehab? And how can we get the urologic oncology patients involved in prehabilitation? Um, Scott is the director of oncologic prehabilitation at Smilo, currently works very closely with mostly breast cancer patients and GI cancer patients. Both the breast and the GI service lines currently have are working on integration into their EMR to get more patients that we would identify as frail and in need of PT to their physical therapy. It would likely look like something like sending them there first, see what their baseline is, allowed to estimate their muscle mass, degree of lymphedema, and other concerns that we would have in the preoperative setting. Unfortunately, it's not as integrated and easy as Vanderbilt was able to make it, but it's not that hard either. So in your order set, you would go to ambulatory referral to PT, you would fill out prehab prior to whichever surgery, click on physical therapy, the frequency and the duration. You would say it is a referral to on prehab and you can send it straight to Scott. He, we have had a discussion and he knows and he's ready um, to work with our group and to think about this for our patients. I can also send this as an email to everyone so they have this. Scott then was able to connect me to the other side of things and um, Smilo has with the dietitians. Um, I got to speak with Natalie Smith. Um, she has been working in, for nine years in the nutrition sector, and she is certified in clinical oncology and working with patients. Her original interests were in the head and neck population. As you can imagine, they have very high needs when it comes to oral and parenteral nutrition during their cancer therapy, but has moved on to work for and with patients of all different types of malignancies. What's nice about Natalie and Scott is they both work in Smilo here, they work at SRC, they're in Hamden and North Haven, and they have large teams um, that are available to serve patients <laughs> as needed. Again, not quite the most integrated pathway as well into the epic order set, but anytime you see a patient in clinic, just a simple ambulatory referral to nutrition services. It can be an office visit. You just click on medical nutrition therapy in an initial visit, and you internally refer it to the YNH nutrition clinic. I would hope that we would be able to make these just simple clicks within our order sets every time you go to book a major surgery, just so you don't have to go through these and take an extra second to think about it, but you identify a patient that may benefit from either physical therapy or nutrition therapy. And this is stuff we have literally on the first floor right of Smilo Cancer Center. So, the, so in conclusion, who is looking at this and what are we doing about it? Um, Dr. Marr reached out to me and just wanted me to bring up the fact that she has a pilot research proposal talking about this exact thing. And it was just kind of that the stars aligned that I decided to make my presentation about this. And she had already been working toward this with a group of our attendings here, thinking of planning a randomized control trial and preoperative nutrition supplementation and radical cystectomy patients using an immunonutrition shake preoperatively, a therapeutic nutrition postoperatively and measuring a number of outcomes. A goal of this would be, as I mentioned, a workflow advisory tool in EPIC, screening preoperative nutrition status in bladder cancer patients, and hoping to incorporate nutritional supplementation into the <laughs> protocol. 
that is all I have today. I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to me. I especially want to thank Scott and Natalie for taking time to have me knock on your doors and um, talk about us and be interested in working with our urologic oncology population. Thank you. That was a great presentation. I feel yeah. like you're talking to me. <laughs> All right. So two questions. You know, the and just uh, actually um, just one question and one comment. The first question is, you know, two more to Scott. Can we build this into our current case request forms, where the referral for the survivorship prehab are like pops up an automatic click for us, rather than having the additional referrals that we have to do? Because I think, real practically speaking, from a busy clinician perspective. I tell you that two additional clicks are going to be like a lot of time that's been added to our current workflow. Uh, sure, um, that's a great question. And um, I know that, yes, we want to make this as seamless as possible for all of you so that it's easier for you to send your patients our way. We are working on that. Um, I'm actually meeting with the GI surgical team next Friday to talk about this very thing. And so I'm hoping that as we as we start to do this, you know, in um, in GI, that we can carry this over to your population as well, so that yes, it's just a a button that you hit in a in an, in an order set that goes along with nutrition and social work and genetics and all of the other ancillary services that we have here at Yale New Haven Hospital to support our Spalo patients. So it is definitely in the works. Um, so. So stay tuned for that. Um, but yes, um, in the meantime, the way that it was just demonstrated is probably the best way to get patients to us for, for prehab. So just wanted to nail down, you're working on the GI side right now, trying to develop this. That's correct. I'm working um, both with Dr. Billingsley um, and Dr. Traga to build this into the GI surgical sure. population. Uh, and I'm working with uh, Dr. Park and Dr. Berger in the, in the breast center um, to start working on making this more of, a, of an automatic, again, easier service for, uh, for the surgeons to be able to get these patients to us. Okay. So timeline, let's say, when would you be done with these pilot projects, these uh, two um, areas where we could start working on it from our side? Well, if, if you want real time or if you want EL time, um, I, would, I think it's going to, you know, we're going to probably need a few months to go through all of the, uh, the layers and the processes to get to that. Um, but my hope is by the end of this calendar year that we have this up and running. Sure. Okay, so end of the year. Okay. So, um, I, I don't know if Jamie and um, Mary Gray are on the call, but I know like on our division call, we've been going through what we might want in any, not just cancer, but any order set. And some of the things that have come up have been like, I know it hasn't been operationalized, but nutritional counseling, exercise, and that kind of thing. So yeah. I, I, you know, it's like it's far from being operationalized, but I think with, that was probably working towards this. Is that right? Yes. Leslie, thank you so much for mentioning that this is Jamie Cavallo. As many of you know, we are working on our ERAS protocols this year, going division by division. And that is exactly the point, is to add in the prehab, nutrition, exercise, and other elements of our ERAS protocols that need to be updated into the order set so that it's set once the patient is put on that pathway. And it reduces the amount of time that surgeons have to put individual orders in. So I look forward to when we can actually have that meeting with the urologic oncology division. I know it was recently postponed, but as soon as we can get those started, we can get working on that. Right, right. I have a quick question, Scott. Um, David Hess here. We tried to uh, introduce a program for our new bladder cancer clinic to have everybody go to nutrition preoperatively. And we got a lot of pushback saying that um, they couldn't see these patients unless they had a Medicare patient, so unless they had a diagnosis of diabetes. Is that true? And the second thing is, it seemed like there was a cost issue in terms of <clears throat> recruiting enough nutritionists to um, participate in any active prehab? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I, for the, the first half of that, uh, I don't know on the rehab side of things if we if the patient has to have a diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, I will tell you what I've been doing so far with 
a lot of the patients that I see, especially the, the, the GI patients, is that, you know, as was alluded to earlier, that they have a lot of existing comorbidities. And so they're probably, you know, they're probably not in, you know, triathlon shape. And so I've been using the ICD-10 code of physical deconditioning, and I have not gotten any pushback on that. Uh, from Medicaid or from any of the private insurance companies. So that's how I've been putting it in as, as, a, as an encounter within Epic. Um, and then the, the second half of your, your question there as far as staffing, that I think, yes, is a, uh, is a challenge uh, across the board, not just in, in, in the nutrition department or the rehab department, but I think across the, the healthcare network. Um, my, my hope is that I can educate enough of my colleagues so that even if you know, they just do a prehab screening, a prehab assessment, and we all kind of are on the same page as what are, we, what are the outcome measures that you know, across the Smilo network, across the five hospitals and throughout the care centers that we're all using, just to get that baseline data. And, you know, and then you know, if they need to, to follow up you know, with me or with any of our other oncology specific PTs, um, you know, especially after treatment, if there's any other treatment that's required, then they can do that. Um, but yes, it's, it's my goal to be able to empower um, and educate more of my rehab colleagues so that even as, a, as an initial touch point, that prehab initial touch point, we have the, the ability to, to get those patients in on a timely fashion get that screening and get that baseline data, do the education. And then if they need more intensive hands-on treatment, then they can, it can be triaged to, to me or our other oncology specific PTs. Thank you. And just one more comment about the studies that you presented. I think those actually underscore the exact issues we face as, face as a surgeon. And you're really talking about a clinical trial, randomized clinical trial to understand or try to prove a point. 30 patients, 60 patients, 100 patients, they're not adequate. So for you to draw a, some sort of conclusions, right, from those underpowered studies is not the justice. If you look at our medical oncology colleagues, right, I mean, they're talking about trials, at least minimum five, 600 patients, thousands of patients mm -hmm. there. So I think therein lies the challenge as a surgeon for us in running clinical trials. And it's actually a call for us to, to do those type of adequate trials to really answer this question. So I think that is why it's important for us to leverage our size because I think Yale is getting up there. And um, just again, on the record with um, Dr. Martin, you know, that pilot study was funded with the idea that Yale will be part of this wave where I think we'll now be able to conduct proper trials of proper size so it can really get at the answer. Okay. Thank you again, Scott, for joining us this morning. Thank you, everyone. One, one, quick, one quick comment about nutrition. Um, so I think just a few issues. One is that if we place a preoperative nutrition consult, the patients often never hear from nutrition. And so even when a consult is placed, the patients don't hear. And so I would just caution everyone until um, that issue gets resolved. Um, if you tell your patient that they're going to hear from nutrition, even if, even if you, you give them a diagnosis of severe malnutrition um, and you place a nutrition consult, um, most often or very often, at least, they don't actually ever hear from nutrition. That's one. The second is I think um, we need to look at um, uh, there's a lot of inconsistency with respect to diet, post-operative diets. And so for radical cystectomy patients who have a bowel anastomosis, we often use a low residue diet. And depending on who they speak to, they can be given some incredibly restrictive instructions around, um, around what a, a low fiber or low residue diet is. And the patients, um, we can actually probably exacerbate people's malnutrition post-op um, because people just can't get in enough calories. And it, a, a third point is just around nutrition follow-up. So when we send a patient out um, on an altered diet, um, there's oftentimes not, um, uh, or mo never really, is there any nutrition follow-up. So follow-up from the nutrition service to make sure someone is actually doing okay on that diet, that they're getting in adequate calories. So there's, I mean, uh, rather than just kind of prehab, I think we need to think about an entire kind of more comprehensive um, uh, before surgery in the hospital and post-op and make sure we're actually giving people like reasonable instructions and that they're actually doing okay. Um, I think a nice example is uh, low fat diets after retroperitoneal node dissection. Um, there's a huge amount of inconsistency uh, with respect to, to those. And there's often pushback from the nutrition service 
um, about, uh, you know, well, well, you know, why does someone need to be on a low fat diet after RPLND? Um, <laughs> every single time it's educating the nutritional service about why we actually need to do that. The role of medium chain triglycerides and keeping people's calorie intake up. Um, but it's, um, it's a, it's, it's a battle every single time. And so I would just ask for um, kind of consistency in responding to consults um, and also consistency in educating our patients after surgery about their diet and then follow up to make sure they're getting in enough calories. So uh, we'll be moving on to our, our next speaker, um, Natasha Jones. She is one of our PGY3 residents and she's been giving uh, talk. Her talk is flaps galore, commonly used flaps in general urinary reconstruction. Uh, okay. uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, my name is Taj Jones, I'm one of the PGY3 urology residents. And my talk today is on flaps galore, commonly used flaps in general urinary reconstruction. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank Dr. Hittleman who inspired this talk. Um, and for the sake of time, because the world of recon, specifically with flaps, is so broad and diverse, uh, this talk will be focused on primarily urethral reconstruction, um, specifically more pertaining to um, disease related to stricture disease. Um, but I'll begin by defining uh, what a flap is in comparison to a graft, um, review the types of flaps, particularly free versus pedicled review some terminology associated with flaps, um, and then discuss the indications for use of flaps in GE reconstruction. Um, given, the given that this talk is focused on urethral stricture disease, uh, primarily um, I will review briefly penile urethral anatomy um, and some uh, discussion about uh, stricture disease. And then lastly, I'll go through specific flaps. Um, and essentially they're broken down into two categories, penile versus non-penile flaps. So a graft is a transfer of tissue um, where you maintain, a, um, where you, uh, the blood supply is completely removed. Um, this is in comparison to a flap where you transfer the tissue, um, but you maintain its intrinsic blood supply from one part of the body to another. And this is probably the simplest definition. Um, there's different types of flaps. Um, so there's free flaps, and this is where you have a flap that's detached from the donor site. Um, and uh, you then surgically reconnect uh, the vessels around the, the area of interest using uh, microsurgical techniques. Um, the first flap, free flap I've ever seen done was an, an anterior lateral thigh flap um, for um, a patient who had a partial glossectomy uh, for oropharyngeal carcinoma. And I thought it was an incredible case to see. Um, next, you have pedicle flaps, or uh, these are also called local flaps, and these are rotated around an adjacent area to your area of interest. And you rotate it around an intact vascular pedicle. Um, so you never transect the blood supply um, for this. So the classic example of the one that I first saw was a tram flap using breast recon. Um, and in general, the pedicle flaps are the most commonly used types of flaps in uh, neurology. So diving more specifically into pedicle flaps, um, you can have different types. You can have an advancement flap where you move um, forward without any lateral movement. Um, you can have a rotation flap where you rotate around a certain specific pivot point. Um, you can have a transposition where you move laterally and an interpolation where there's a skin bridge and you essentially tunnel your flap to that adjacent area. Some guiding principles for just uh, reconstruction in general, but also just GU. You want to really think about the nature of the flap tissue that you're using. Um, and this is critical because uh, if you're doing any kind of recon where you're, um, the flap will be exposed to urine, uh, which is a wet environment, sometimes acidic, et cetera. Uh, you want to think about the flap tissue um, mm -hmm. that you're using. You certainly want to consider the vasculature. Um, you want to appropriate blood supply, um, and you want to think about its proximity um, to your intended target. Um, you want to think about how you're going to mobilize your flap, um, and this is important to make sure you maintain the um, adequate blood supply as you're transferring um, your flap over. Um, to make sure you don't develop ischemia, et cetera, later. Um, and then one of the just guided principles for flap use um, is that it needs to be non-hair bearing skin. Um, just to uh, dive more into the terminology. So um, you want to consider the orientation of uh, um, how you're going to harvest the flap. So is this will be a longitudinal flap or will this be um, performed in a uh, transverse manner? Consider the location of the tissue of origin. Um, so in thinking about um, penile or urethral reconstruction, you want to think about is tissue going to be um, proximally harvested or uh, distal? Um, you want to consider your uh, blood supply or your pedicle. Are you going to mobilize the pedicle dorsally, uh, ventrolaterally, et cetera? 
And then how are you going to incorporate this uh, flap into your targeted tissue? Will this be an onlay where you essentially um, lay it on the surface of your um, tissue or will you fashion a tube out of your uh, flap? Um, you also want to think about possible uh, combining different types of tissue or tissue transfer. Um, so this is where you combine, for example, um, a bulky mucosal uh, uh, tissue with also a flap, um, um, uh, also applying a flap as well. So what are the indications? When do you want to use a flap in uh, urology? So um, for patients um, with long obliterative strictures, uh, this is a great option for them. If there's any kind of missing or partial urethral plate, um, this can assist with uh, recon in that uh, scenario. Um, sometimes you have really complex hypospadias cases that does require the use of flaps. Um, pelvic trauma is associated with uh, pretty uh, significant bulbal membranous uh, urethral disruption. So um, this may require the use of a flap. Um, if you have patients that are really complex cases that have failed multiple uh, urethroplasties, um, including grafts, uh, this is a great option for them. Um, and if they have a history of radiation, obviously the tissue quality is not great. So a flap use is, um, can be recommended here. And then certainly fistula and uh, four days reconstruction uh, flaps are often used. Uh, but even as I was thinking, um, we also, one emerging field is um, gender affirming surgery, um, which is rapidly becoming um, really popular. Um, and flap use is very common there as well. Um, so just thinking about the penile and urethral anatomy that is relevant to discussing uh, the use of flaps. So um, I'll focus on the blood supply. So the, uh, uh, the penis essentially has a dual blood supply. You have a superficial and a deep. Um, superficially, you have the, it's provided by the external pudential artery and deep, it's um, essentially provided by the internal pudential artery. And this forms a fasciocutaneous system. Um, and this is going to be particularly relevant for your penile flaps uh, later. Um, and then looking at the urethral anatomy, um, the urethra is divided into both anterior and posterior, and this is typically done at the level of the perineal membrane. Uh, anterior, excuse me, posteriorly, uh, you have your prostatic and your membranous urethra. Um, and then anteriorly, you have your, uh, sorry, uh, prostatic and membranous. And then uh, anteriorly, you have uh, your bulbous urethra uh, down to essentially your meatus. The blood supply is the uh, internal pudental artery and specifically the bubble urethral branches. Um, and what's relevant here is that uh, the anterior urethra is surrounded by spongiosum. Um, and this is in contrast to the posterior urethra, which is not. And that's relevant when thinking about stricture disease um, because truly uh, the anterior and posterior quote unquote strictures are, are very different processes. Um, a stricture just for a plain definition is where you have a fixed anatomic point or a fixed uh, point that's uh, of narrowing um, that prohibits instrumentation uh, without being able to disrupt the mucosa. And so anything that injures the urethral, injures the epithelium, um, can lead to also injury um, in the corpus spongiosum, and that can lead to strictures um, secondarily to also that involves spongiofibrosis. This is in contrast to the posterior urethra, where you can get stenosis, et cetera, um, from injury, but because it has no spongiosum, it does not involve spongiofibrosis. And so in general, sometimes the um, flap use in anterior and posterior urethra is managed a little bit differently. And this, this may, uh, is a part of the reason for that. Uh, so let's dive into the flaps. We'll start by discussing penile flaps. And the first one is the Orandi flap. Um, and this was popularized by Dr. Orandi, uh, published in uh, 1972. And uh, just to review our uh, flap and that uh, flap terminology, this is a longitudinal flap. Um, ventral penile skin flap. And uh, the blood supply, as you can see here, um, is coming laterally or the lateral pedicle. And this will be uh, done in an eventual onlay fashion. Um, this is an intraoperative photo of what it actually looks like. So here's your flap. Um, your pedicle has been um, uh, mobilized laterally. Um, the source is the penile skin. These are typically done for patients with penile strictures. Um, and it's limited there in terms of the anterior urethra and not necessarily used in the posterior urethra. Um, the blood supply of the pedicle, as I mentioned, is the darchus vascular pedicle that's been mobilized laterally. Um, and the complications and the challenges, um, one of the big things was a lot of these patients develop urethral diverticula. Um, and in order to perform this flap, you essentially make a midline incision. Um, you then mobilize your um, penile skin flap or your island, um, and then you uh, uh, 
suture your flap to the adjacent urethral plate, uh, which has been open here. Um, and then you do a ventral on there. Um, and so the biggest complication, as I mentioned earlier, was the urethral diverticulum. You can see here um, by the pooling of contrast in the diverticulum. And this is because the ventral urethra is not well supported in contrast to the um, dorsal urethra, which has the uh, corporal cavernosa um, supporting it there. So as a result, um, a modified arandi was developed. Um, and the idea behind this is that you essentially mobilize the urethra quite a bit. Um, you um, elevate it off of the, um, the corporal cavernosa, um, and then you make a dorsal incision into your urethra. Um, and then you uh, do a dorsal onlay of your flap. Um, this is a much more technically difficult uh, mm -hmm. surgery to perform. You do a lot of mobilization of your urethra. And um, if your flap is too large or if there's difficulty with the reconstruction, one of the biggest concerns here was that a lot of patients would develop into fish lips. Um, next up, we have a uh, pedicle facial flap. Um, and this is, can be done in a patient who has not been circumcised. And this is pretty similar to what we do for peds um, in terms of uh, their hypospadias repair. The indications here are really long with literative anterior with strictures. And again, as the mentioned, hypospadias. The source is the prep use. Um, and the challenges of the complications is you can develop a lot of necrosis of the flap, um, also fistulas as well as diverticula. Um, and again, it's because you're mobilizing skin and if your blood supply is compromised in any way, this can be <laughs> It's also a ventral onlay, which puts you at risk for uh, diverticula. Um, so this flap, you essentially make two circumferential uh, incisions, um, and then you uh, essentially mobilize your uh, flap um, by incising um, ventrally, and then you uh, rotate it for a ventral onlay. <laughs> If you have a patient who's already been circumcised, so you don't have access to uh, prep use skin, one option is the, uh, and I apologize for butchering this, Mackinage. 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 Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Mackinage technique. Um, and so this is again useful for patients with uh, long anterior repo strictures. And the source is the distal, distal penile skin. Mm -hmm. And um, you're, I'll show this a little bit later, but you're mobilizing a lot of skin for this or um, so you can run the risk of insufficient skin closure here, and uh, pretty similar to mobilizing just any type of mobilized lock skin, um, they're at risk for skin or flap necrosis. So for the machinage, you're making a distal and a proximal circumferential incision. Um, distally, it's deep to the bucks. Uh, uh, proximally, it's superficial to bucks. You then incise your um, skin or your island flap eventually. Um, and then you rotate or pivot to um, the, uh, in this case, it's a, um, a pretty extensive uh, stricture. So um, it goes all the way down to the mobile urethra. And so they then have to tunnel this flap a bit in order to uh, close that. Um, but again, you can see there's a lot of tissue mobilized. And so um, that's what's trying to process and start working happen. <clears throat> what about the non penile skin flaps? And these can be used uh, not just for anterior urethral repairs, but also posterior urethral repairs. Um, we'll start with the gracilis muscle flap. Um, the indications here are pretty broad. Um, they can be used in a variety of ways. Uh, you can do an onlay, you can do a wraparound. Um, and this is typically used in patients that have really challenging cases, their, their tissues are poorly vascularized. And the source here is the gracilis muscle. The blood supplies from the medial femoral circumflex artery. Um, and one really um, awesome idea behind this is that uh, using a gracilis flap can be, um, one theory is the vascular induction, which essentially you have introduced new blood supply to an area that was previously, previously a bit ischemic. Um, and it can help support uh, the tissue or your primary reconstruction if you did like a primary anastomotic repair or even a, um, a substitution repair, this can actually support that environment and its yields and improves overall outcomes. So you harvest this flap um, essentially by having the thigh abducted. Um, and then you can uh, use your abductor longus as um, kind of your starter point. The gristless tends to be two to three finger breaths posterior to that. Um, you have the option of doing a separate um, incision where the gristless inserts distally uh, into your media mm -hmm. of the of your um, knee, and then um, that's really used only if you want to harvest full length of your wristless. If not, you can essentially buy, um, bisect it anywhere um, to cover that. <clears throat> 
So um, you can identify the artery, the vein, the pedicle extension, essentially, um, by uh, retracting your reductum longus um, and being able to trace uh, the vessels back that way. And once you have secured your, um, your pedicle, you can then uh, detach the bacillus um, at its insertion point approximately and distal. Um, so once Senator Leahy looked at um, patients who needed really complex repairs, um, who were at really high risk for recurrence, and here they did a combined tissue transfer where they did a bulk and mucosa graft, um, and then they also did a bristle muscle flap. And in their 20 year experience, they had about 30 patients that fit this criteria. Um, and they defined recurrence as, of this structure as inability to pass the 17 French scope. The mean structure length here was 7.6 centimeters. Uh, the location was pretty much anterior and posterior urethra, um, so from the pendulous to the membranous urethra. Ideology for these strictures was radiation at 60%, um, but there was some post practice prop, post prostatectomy patients as well. The mean follow-up was 32 months, and the rate of successful urethral reconstruction um, was defined as 76.7%. Uh, um, so this was a pretty good outcome for a lot of these really complex patients. So something to consider to incorporate in your repair. Um, I just wanted to include a couple of another ways or uses for this. Um, so in this example, you have a, a gentleman with a right-sided uh, mixed germ cell um, tumor. Uh, that essentially crossed midline. And after resection, there was a refill defect uh, that they repaired. And then they used the gracilis flap here uh, as an onlay to help support as the patient was recovering. Another example here is a gentleman with rectal carcinoma that was invaded in his prostate. After resection, they had a four centimeter defect uh, that they repaired essentially by the nasimos in the bladder neck to the, um, to the uh, transected uh, urethra at that point. And then they use a gristillus flap, um, as demonstrated here in our schematic, as a wraparound to help uh, promote, uh, uh, to improve the blood flow, um, to help the tissue recover better um, and have better outcomes. So just some uses for it. And next, I want to talk about what I define as the Hail Mary of urethroplasties, which is an entire urethroplasty. Um, this can be used for um, a wide variety of uses, but pretty much on the salvo of the structures. This is like a last resort type of thing if patients really do desire some sort of urethroplasty uh, reconstruction. Um, and also, you can do that, do the, this for a patient with like long traumatic defects of so their bulbar membranous urethra. Um, the source typically is the sigmoid colon, which is preferred. Um, but uh, one paper that I looked at used um, any number of different parts of the bowel. The complications uh, stem from the uh, manipulation of bowel, which includes sepsis, peritonitis, et cetera. And these patients tend to have post void dribbling. So to harvest this, um, they make two incisions, perineal and supercubic. Um, the perineal incision, you expose the anterior urethra um, and then incise it. The supercubic, you expose the posterior urethra. Um, and they dissect it through the space of red space here. They pass the bogey through the bladder, bladder neck and then incise the posterior urethra. Um, and then uh, mobilize the posterior urethra as well. Then they did something which I thought was really interesting, which is an inferior pubectomy, which you can kind of see demonstrated with here. Um, and this was to decrease the gap between um, the distal end and their bowel segment. And then they disconnected the bowel in the following way. As you can see, um, B is what are actually going to use to fashion their neo-urethra. Um, and they sacrifice segment C uh, to be able to have a longer pedicle uh, to be able to get their flap to where they needed it. And they did an uh, end to end anastomosis of A and D. Um, but what if you don't want to do an extensive urethroplasty for your patient? What if you want to offer your patients an option that, yes, they have pretty extensive disease, but may not want to go through that entire surgery? One option is a perineal urethrostomy. And even in this case, you can incorporate flaps. Um, and so this is the Blandy technique. The indication here is a patient with lichen sclerosis uh, that's more distal in, in their disease. Um, as well as I've seen this used here um, for squamous cell carcinoma of the penis. Um, and as I mentioned before, older men who really do not want an extensive repair. Some contraindications, you are um, essentially incising into the urethra um, just um, distal to the sphincter. And so if you have patients with posterior disease, this would be a contraindication because you will not be addressing the um, underlying issue there. And then if you have poor external sphincteric function, your patients are just going to leak. 
Um, so this might not be a great choice for them. But here, the uh, source of the flap is an harvested uh, U-shaped perineal scrotal flap. And the challenges here is um, if you have any men who've had radiated tissue, they tend to restenose um, their perineal, uh, of restenose, they get restenosis of their perineal urethrosting. Um, so that's one thing to counsel them on. But the technique here, um, the patient's in high lithotomy. Um, you do an inverted U-shaped incision in the upper perineum right below the scrotum. And the flap here is a mobilization of a full thickness uh, fat pad underneath the skin of the uh, bulbo cavernosis muscle. Um, you then separate the muscle. Uh, you open up the bulbar urethra. If you encounter disease, you have the option of going more proximally. Um, and then you essentially just uh, uh, suture the open urethrotomy to the skin and um, making sure you um, preserve the dorsal uh, urethral plate. And you do this in three layers. You include the urethral mucosa, the spongiosum, uh, just the adventitial edge, and the skin edge as well. Um, and that's pretty much all I have in terms of flaps. Um, so I do want to end by just revisiting some of the really key and crucial parts of um, flap use which is essentially, if you want to consider the nature of the flap, the vasculature, how you're going to mobilize it. It needs to be non-hair bearing. And I'm hopeful that this talk kind of um, highlighted or um, uh, taught, taught you guys essentially uh, the use of penile versus non-penile flaps for urethral reconstruction. So I just want to thank Dr. Sterling and Dr. Cavallo um, uh, for their assistance to put this presentation together. Thank you. I really enjoyed it again. Uh, I think the uh, presence this morning was just awesome. Um, but uh, what about the uh, the buck of mucosa graft? You know, how come that was not covered? Oh, so, so this is strictly flaps. Um, I didn't include grafts because okay. clearly, like the studies are out, grafts are the way to go. But if you have a patient um, who essentially has failed grafts, what do you do? How can you help them? And this is kind of the point of the talk. So, so Taj, from you know reading about all these different flaps, why do you think people are moving more towards grafts? So, <laughs> um, from reading about it, I will say um, the failure rate over time is higher on flaps. Um, the surgeries and the reconstructive uh, aspects of it uh, tend to be more challenging, I think, than using grafts. Um, and so, I think you should definitely start with grafts before you move on to this, but this is just like a backup option if it fails. Okay. Exactly. To, to be able to mobilize and, and have a good broad base of your blood supply for those flaps, especially those clean out flaps, yeah. um, they are much more technically difficult surgeries. Yes. Is this more of like a historic perspective, or is this, are, you, are there so reasons where you would actually prefer to use your craft over your flap over your um, your with your talk, your initial talk, your introduction to the part of this. Yeah. So use it like hot sauce. For <laughs> for most of the issues that we kind of came up here, um, a graft is a little easier, has a little better. Um, the downside of flaps is most of them just because of the where you're putting the blood supply, you're gonna do eventually. And then you're gonna open up the patient up both to fistula uh, because you're taking penile scan as well as diverticulum. So anytime you can put it dorsally, you have the, as Tajna said, the support of the cavernosum that you don't get that. For the um, perineal urethrostomy, so anything where it's just kind of a, a local use of tissue as opposed to so any rotational flaps, flaps are still great for that. Um, you know, as Tajna alluded to now with bringing in uh, gender affirming surgery, that's when a lot of these flaps are gonna be used. Mm -hmm both for vaginal plasty as well as free flaps for balloplasty. So you're still using flaps for our, you know, uh, horny age patients. Yeah, and right, that's great. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, go ahead. This is a uh, Jamie Caval. Just would just add to that, that sometimes patients who have recalcitrant strictures exhaust their options for grafts. So if you've completely exhausted your own oral mucosa over multiple surgeries over their lifetime, a next option could be rectal mucosa, which you can harvest through a TEMS procedure um, minimally invasively. Um, but if they have contraindications to that, including GI disease, then flaps would be a great option. And another indication would be if the patient has poor vascular supply to the tissue, for instance, irradiated 
um, surfaces than grafts may not take. And therefore flaps would be a great option because they bring their own blood supply. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.